empower me. Wow. Wisdom over wounds. December 2nd. Christian perfection. Not that I have already attained or am already perfect. Philippians chapter 3 verse 12. It is a trap to presume that God wants to make us perfect specimens of what he can do. God's purpose is to make us one with himself. The emphasis of holiness movements tends to be that God is producing specimens of holiness to put in his museum. If you accept this concept of personal holiness, your life's determined purpose will not be for God, but for what you call the evidence of God in your life. How can we say, it could never be God's will for me to be sick, if it was God's will to bruise his own son? Isaiah chapter 53 verse 10. Why shouldn't he bruise you? What shines forth and reveals God in your life is not your relative consistency to an idea of what a saint should be, but your genuine living relationship with Jesus Christ and your unrestrained devotion to him, whether you are well or sick. Christian perfection is not and never can be human perfection. Christian perfection is the perfection of a relationship with God that shows itself to be true even amid the seemingly unimportant aspects of human life. When you obey the call of Jesus Christ, the first thing that hits you is the pointlessness of the things you have to do. The next thought that strikes you is that other people seem to be living perfectly consistent lives. Such lives may leave you with the idea that God is unnecessary, that through your own human effort and devotion, you can attain God's standard for your life. In a fallen world, this can never be done. I am called to live in such a perfect relationship with God that my life produces a yearning for God in the lives of others, not admiration for myself. Thoughts about myself hinder my usefulness to God. God's purpose is not to perfect me to make me a trophy in his showcase. He is getting me to the place where he can use me. Let him do what he wants. Wow. What a simple word. Empower me. Wow. Wisdom over wounds. Lord, help me to see. Your perfect purpose is not to perfect me or to make me a trophy in your showcase. But you are getting me to a place where you can use.
use me. How many of you know that God wants to use you today? God wants to use you in your imperfected state. Let him do what he wants to do with you. We have so many challenges against allowing God to mold us and make us into what he designed for us from the beginning of the earth. He said before you were formed in your mother's womb, formed, being made. He said, I knew you before you were formed. So God had a plan for you. And he has been trying to get you to a place to where you would surrender. I'm hearing that word surrender today. Surrender to the will of God and not to the desire that you have for yourself. The topic today, Christian perfection. Found again in Philippians chapter 3 verse 12. Not that I have already attained or am already purpose. Perfect. It is a trap to presume that God wants to make us perfect specimens of what he can do. The emphasis of holiness tends to be that God is producing specimens of holiness. That's a place we have not attained. So we come to Paul's epistle in the Philippians. It says, Finally, my brother, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. The key word here, he says, is finally. Finally doesn't indicate a conclusion, but a transition. Paul is talking about us being transformed into the image of Christ Jesus. Paul covers many essential things here for the Christian life, such as joy, marks of a true believer, and the privilege of knowing Christ. Paul repeatedly mentions his joy despite his sufferings and urges the Philippians to Do the same. Philippians 2 verse 18. But here is more specific. He wants them to rejoice in the Lord. This joy isn't superficial happiness that comes from circumstances. But a perpetual gladness of the heart, an everlasting gladness of the heart that comes from knowing, experiencing, and trusting Jesus. We can rejoice in God's salvation. That's found in Psalms chapter 40, verse 16, 64 and 10, 63, 11. 51 and 12. His justice is found in Proverbs 21 and 15. His protection is found in Psalms 63 and 7. And his word, Psalm 119, 162. Jeremiah. 15 and 16. 
since joy is essential for the Christian life, Paul warns the Philippians about those who threaten it. Even if it made him sound like a broken record, chanting the same things Paul didn't mind, he knew it's safe for believers to hear God's word often. He probably also wanted the Philippians to listen to his teachings repeatedly so that they will remember them after he had left. That's found in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12 through 15. I hope you got your notepad here today. These things refer to the text that follows because Paul wrote about the opponents of the gospel earlier in Philippians chapter 1, verse 28. He said, false teachers, like their father, the devil, only seek to steal, kill, and destroy our joy in the Lord. Paul was warning about them. And the warning is a safeguard to maintain true believers versus false believers. He said, Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. Uh Uh-oh, some of y'all. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Paul's warning was concerned about a specific group of people called Judaizers, the first heretics of church history. They falsely believed and taught that Gentile Christians must perform what we talked about on the last uh, conversation, Mosaic Law works, such as they had to have circumcision to be saved. That's found in Acts chapter 15, verse 1. Their name even originates from a Greek word meaning to live according to the Jews, Judaizers. That's found in Galatians chapter 2, verse 14. Paul adamantly refuted this false gospel. And the epistle of Galatians was his response to it. And just as he warned the Galatians, he also urged the Philippians to be concerning and to watch out. The Judaizers posed a severe threat to the church as evidenced by Paul's powerful language to describe them. He said they were opponents of the gospel. Dogs. In first century Israel, dogs were unclean animals. Jews didn't keep them as house pets as we do today. Back then, dogs were wild animals, scavengers, always roaming the street and rummaging for something to devour. Like dogs, The Judaizers were vicious. They attacked the sheep of Christ to spread their filthy and corrupt lies. Evildoers. The Judaizers preached a different gospel. Let me say that again. The Judaizers preached a different gospel. They emphasize their works instead of the final atoning work of Christ on the cross. This is the height of wickedness. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Any message that points away from his glorious gospel is evil. And those who promote it are evil workers. The next thing he said is mutilators. Circumcision was a sign of God's covenant with Abraham 
and his descendants and a requirement to be of the people of God. But Christ fulfilled this covenant on the cross and no one needs to be circumcised to be a member of the household of God. Yet the Judaizers were still preaching its necessity for salvation. So Paul calls them mutilators or in Greek false circumcision. They were cutting up their flesh in vain because it had no spiritual significance. It only burdened the believers. Paul then contrasts these false teachers and their false circumcision with genuine believers who are the true circumcision. The marks of true believers. True circumcision is of the heart. That's found in Romans chapter 2, verse 29, and it says, but a Jew is one inwardly, and the circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. This concept harks back to Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6, which says, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offsprings so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. God doesn't call Christians to circumcise their flesh but to circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 16. While we know that many of the things that the children of Israel did were laws of cleanliness while they circled out in the wilderness they discovered through science that what probably kept the children of Israel alive all those years is their cleanliness laws. They washed their hands before they ate. They were circumcised so that the men would not pass on diseases to the women. They had many laws that God gave them to keep them clean, the flesh clean. So this is not saying that if a person wants to be circumcised or their family members want them to be circumcised that they cannot do it. But Paul is talking about the circumcision that was used in honor of salvation or as a right to God by circumcising the flesh and God was saying the circumcision of the heart is what matters the most the circumcision that saves occurs when the sword of the word of God pierces our hard hearts Paul also mentions three marks of the true circumcision. We worship by the Spirit of God. Worship in Greek means to render religious service or homage. It's only through the regenerative power of the Holy Spirit that we can worship God in spirit and truth. That's found in John chapter 4 verse 23 through 24. Performing empty rituals is not worship and it doesn't please God. 
God. That's found in Matthew chapter 15, verse 8 through 9. The next of the three is as we glory in Christ. The Greek word for glory means boast and exultant joy. True believers joyfully boast about the work of Christ. Galatians chapter 6 verse 14. We rejoice in who Christ is and recognize that apart from him, we can do nothing or no thing. That's John chapter 15 verse 5. His atoning work is not a backdrop to our own achievement in keeping the law. And the third thing Paul said, we put no confidence in the flesh. True believers put their faith in Christ alone, not works of the flesh. We don't add or subtract anything to the atoning work of Christ. Instead, we recognize that nothing we do apart from having faith in Christ will save us. And even having faith is a gift from God. It's not of our works. That's found in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. To sum it up, a genuine believer is one who worships God by his grace alone, who boasts in the cross alone, and who acknowledges that his best works in the flesh are filthy rags before a holy God. We boast in Christ alone. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. No one understands the superiority of God's grace over man's work more than Paul. Before God saved him, he had all the righteousness the law could offer and more street credit than the Judaizers. Paul was famous, known as Saul. First, he was recognized on the eighth day. The Mosaic law required male Jews to be circumcised on the eighth day. So Paul had the right beginning in life and hailed from a family who kept the Torah. Second, he was of the people of Israel. The Israelites were God's chosen people, the only nation that bears his name and with whom he established a covenant. To be Israelite was a considerable privilege. It practically made Paul royalty. Third, he was of the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin was an elite tribe. He was the only tribe that remained with Judah and the Davidic line when Israel split into two kingdoms. The first king of Israel, Saul, was of the tribe of Benjamin and Jerusalem and the temple was in the land of Benjamin. Fourth, he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. Paul was born into a Jewish family and maintained his Hebrew roots. He spoke the Hebrew language. He adopted Jewish customs and studied under Gamaliel, a decorated rabbi. He was as Hebrew as it got. Fifth, he was a Pharisee. Pharisees means separated ones. They were a religious 
mindset with strict adherence to the Mosaic law. No one was more religious than a Pharisee. Sixth, he was a precursor of the church or a prosecutor of the church. Paul was a pious, committed, and passionate Jew. So many people don't know that Paul was actually a Jew. So much so, he relentlessly persecuted those who opposed his God. Paul was one on fire for the Lord. Did you hear what I just said? Paul was considered on fire for the Lord and was no lukewarm Jew. He wasn't halfway stepping. He was 100% into being a Jew. Seventh and last, he was law-abiding. Paul was highly moral and scrupulous. He didn't keep the law perfectly as only Christ could do it. But he kept it better than most and was beyond reproach. If the law had the power to save anyone, Paul would have been the first in line. But Paul didn't count on his accomplishments or privilege like the Judaizers. He didn't boast of his remarkable works under the law. Instead, he said, But far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Galatians 6.14 We just shared that about two podcasts back. The surpassing worth of knowing Jesus. But whenever gain, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Paul wanted to be found in Paul not only distrusted his past achievements, but he also considered them as a loss or a poor deal. Why? He says because of Christ. Before his conversion, Paul counted his noble birth, heritage, titles, and morality as things that profited him for salvation and put them under his asset column. But after encountering the risen Jesus and seeing the glory of his salvation, Paul assessed his calculation, or reassessed his calculation. He realized that everything in his asset column brought him no profit. They were actually a loss because they brought condemnation upon himself. His works were so utterly useless that Paul called them rubbish. The Greek word used is skubala, which means dung, manure, scraps of garbage, and waste thrown to dogs. He considered all his works and prestige as filthy rags to discard before Christ. Having moved his works to the liability column, Paul now lists what he has gained in having Christ, his actual profits. These are faith and righteousness, which is justification knowledge of Christ and Christ likeness which is sanctification and resurrection from the dead glorification 
Father. We gain this righteousness only by God's gift of faith. Not our merit. It's contracted, contrary to the false righteousness that the Judaizers were preaching. The one that depends on works. The law cannot make anyone right with God. Knowing Jesus is more than an intellectual exercise. It's experiencing him as a matter of dealing with him as. He opens up to you and being dealt with by him as he takes knowledge of you. When we have a personal relationship with Jesus, we benefit from the comfort of his love, fellowship through his indwelling spirit, encouragement, loving kindness, and affection. As we grow in our knowledge of Christ, God gives us the inestimable gift of becoming like him. He shapes our life to be like his son. So we will walk in holiness. That's found in 1 John chapter 2 verse 6. And share his suffering. Philippians 1.29. 1 Peter 2.21. These are prophets. Because without holiness, no one will see the Lord. That's found in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And those who suffer with Christ will glory with him. The last benefit Paul mentions is the final resurrection of the dead. God has promised us eternal life. 1 John chapter 2 verse 25. Verse chapter 5 and 11. It doesn't mean we will never die. For it has been appointed for all men to die once. But our death will not be final. As Jesus rose from the dead, we too shall be raised. And because he lives, we will live also. That's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 17. This is the Christian hope. Paul was willing to give everything he held dear, including his life. For this glorious promise. Are you willing? Hallelujah. Are you willing to give your life for this glorious promise? To have him. To know him as Lord. And to be found in him is immeasurably better. Than anything we could ever have. But sometimes. We don't appreciate him and his gift as we should. So many times we complain, disobey his commands. Endless gratitude to God should mark the Christian life. For all he has given us in Christ. Even if God does what we say, nothing else for us in this life. We would still have reasons to rejoice and be thankful. Father, to my family, my friends, my loved ones, my acquaintances on this night. We are wretched sinners saved by a gracious God. And apart from him, we are nothing. It's an uncomfortable truth. But we need it in front center of our mind. We are nothing without God. You and I are miserable sinners in need of God's grace. And we can do nothing without it. Father, I thank you 
Thank you for another day that we've never seen before. Thank you for your surpassing worth in knowing Christ Jesus. Thank you for the scripture today, Philippians 3.12. Not that I have already attained or am already perfect. The title today is Christian Perfection. Is there really such a thing? Can we make ourselves perfect? Or is it only through holiness without which no man shall see the Lord? Father, we thank you today. We want to see you, Lord, in the beauty of holiness. We surrender, Lord, our will, our mind, our thoughts to you today. Lord, be with us in trouble. Lord, be with us on this journey. So many are in dire straits right now. So many suffering on the path of grief. Father, I thank you that you are healing the broken hearts today. You are healing the saddened spirits. You are saving the suicidal hearts right now. You are enlightening the depressed mind right now. Anxiety Loose your hold off of the people on this line today. Loose your hold. You have no right to God's children. You have no right to their physical body. You have no right to their mind. You have no right to their hearts. Ah, Heal the stab wound. I'm seeing a stab wound. Heal the stab wound. Even if it's the stabbing wound from the offending spirit, the enemy, the devil, Satan, Lucifer, whatever name you want to call it. Heal, Lord, heal. Heal, Lord, heal. We're calling on your healing power to do your deliverance power to set, to shake off the obstacles, not down roadblocks. I'm seeing some big, gigantic concrete blocks in some of you. Blocks just blocking. Every time you go to the right, it's like another one appears. You go to the left and another one appears. Father, I thank you that you are giving us the victory to sprint over the top of those roadblocks by your power and by your majesty sprint over those roadblocks sprint Woo, over those obstacles Father I thank you because they are nothing to you they're only in our eyes appearing to be more than they are that's what the Lord just said these roadblocks are only in your eyes appearing to be more than they are. But you are a magnificent sprinter. In the spirit realm, we shall soar over every obstacle. Father, mount us up on wings like an eagle. Father, let us Walk and not be weary. Let us run and not faint. Father, we thank you that you are preparing us for things that are ahead. We are in a disastrous time. I'm hearing the word disastrous time. You cannot Put your head down in a hole like an ostrich 
and expect that everything will blow by without having any kind of effect on you. I'm hearing the word watch as well as pray. Don't just turn everything off and you don't even know what's going on. Watch as well as pray. The word of God said, If one knew what time the thief was coming, they would be watching, watching, so that the thief would not come upon them and surprise them. There were always watchmen in the towers surrounding the innocent people and guarding the homes and the territory. I don't remember the uh, the scripture, but I remember hearing watchmen, what are the hour? Woo, you must know what hour you reside in today. What is the hour? hour that the clock is on. Are we on the last 1159 ready to change over to almost midnight? What of the hour watchman? What time is it? Your spirit ought to be bearing witness with the time that we're in unless you're ignoring it and so worried about your next date so worried about the next club you're going to attend so worried about the next activities you're going to perform so worried about the next fantastic event even your events for God has turned into clubbery you can't wait to march down the aisle and let everybody see your fancy clothes. Women and men. Now you can have fancy clothes, but the clothes can't have you. Father, I thank you for opening the eyes of your people today. Father, children are being neglected. Father, food is scarce in some places. And the adults are so busy looking around that they're not paying attention to their little children. Father, I thank you that you seal our children so that the things that are on the television, on the internet, in the airwaves are not corrupting our little bitty kids. Father, I thank you that this next generation it's going into a hotter frying pan than even we went into. But Father, you are able to fill these children with the Holy Ghost. Give them power from on high. Not only the mother and father, but let these children begin to lay hands on the sick. Let these children begin to cast out devils. You are not a respecter of age. Father, I thank you. I thank you that even in my life with the pastor that we had, he said, if the old folks won't go, Pastor Duffy, he said, if the old folks won't go, I'll take the kids. He trained churches and kids. You're not scared of no devil. Cast the devil out. Lay hands on the sick. We had shut-ins. The children did. And on Sunday morning, the Holy Ghost would grace our services. And every service we had, our children, our young people, don't come to church without your sword and your word. We didn't go to school without our sword of the spirit, the word of God, in our purse, in our backpack. I don't care if they call you religious nut. I'll be a religious nut until the day I die. 
I thank God for calling me at the age of 12 years old. I give you glory, Lord. And you put that love, thank you, Father. You put that love of Jesus down in my heart. So many of us are moving on up in age, but we still, we have the love of God down in our hearts. As we grow older, Lord, strengthen our limbs, strengthen our body, strengthen our minds, strengthen our hearts. Father, in these hard times of grief, be with us, Lord. I have so many friends on my line today crying out with grief, including myself. I've lost at least two or three this week, Father. I thank you that you give us strength. Your scripture says, I will weep no more. Weep no more. Weep no more. Father, help my loved ones online to stop weeping. You said joy cometh in the morning. Just make it through the night. And so, Lord, we thank you today for another podcast. Empower me. Wow, wisdom over wounds. Found on most podcast channels. Playing simultaneously with that is another one of my podcasts called The Drill Sergeant Series. Making Jewels. In that God has given me nuggets of gold for fiery triumphs you have an opportunity, click over and listen to those life-saving and life-changing drills that will cause you to remember the things you need to know in times of peril and distress. If any of these messages bless you, click like or share. Send me an emoji, emoticon. Send me a message if you like. I don't want no message with no hanky-panky on it. Send me a correct and a just message in the name of Jesus. So remember us on a day-to-day basis, praying for you. Remember me in your prayers. This is Sister Barbara, and God bless you, and I love you. Bye-bye.